All right, let's uh, summarize where we are. Uh, I think uh, we, we've talked about the beeper attack, uh, which basically took out about 4,000 plus uh, Hezbollah fighters of various ranks um, it, it, all over Lebanon, uh, but also including in Syria and, and elsewhere. It wasn't just the beepers, it was other communication devices, other electronic devices that also exploded one of the greatest intelligence offensive military feats in all of human history, I think. Truly an, an amazing, an amazing thing. And I said at the time, uh, that is a great setup for uh, an all-out war and, and uh, an all-out attack of Israel on the Hezbollah and on Lebanon. Uh, that turned out to be phase one. Phase two, and I don't know if Israel knew this was going to be a phase two, or if it just got lucky, if you will, uh, phase two was uh, a bombing of a meeting of uh, senior Hezbollah members, uh, senior Hezbollah uh, uh, commanders in Beirut, um, uh, what was it, two days ago, uh, where not only did they kill who, uh, the guy who is, uh, was the, uh, uh, the chief of operations for the Hezbollah militarily, but also managed to kill the entire leadership of the Radwan force, which is the the special uh, forces of the Hezbollah, the, the best trained, uh, the ones who uh, you know, did a lot of the fighting in Syria, got a lot of experience fighting, uh, and the ones that were most feared of all the Hezbollah fighting forces, they were the most feared, and basically their entire leadership was wiped out. So now you've got basically the entire leadership of Hamas. Remember, Israel had already killed the former head of operations, they'd already killed many of the uh, Hamas leadership, Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah leadership. And, and basically, the entire Hezbollah leadership is, is, has been wi like wiped out, at least at the very top, and what one, even one layer or two layers beneath that. Um, over the last 11 months, the way things have been going is Israel, you know, Hezbollah sends missiles to Israel, most of them don't land, almost all of them are knocked out of the air, Casualties in the Israeli side are minimal, and then Israel retaliates by bombing a few places in uh, in in Lebanon, uh, weapons depots, assassinating uh, Hamas fighters. About 500 Hamas, eh, Hezbollah again, Hezbollah fighters. About about uh, uh, 500 Hezbollah fighters were killed in this way through basically targeted assassinations or targeted bombings of particular Hezbollah facilities over the last 11 months. Um, and yesterday, there was significant bombing uh, of uh, uh, more Hezbollah weapons depots, and, and it, looked, it was pretty intense. About 150 targets were targeted, and uh, major, major explosions, major fires. They hit major. Uh, but today, there was a real shift strategically. And this is really phase three of what they're doing. Israel basically today told... Um, civilians in South Lebanon to leave their homes, to leave South Lebanon. Uh, the way they described it as, it turns out, and, and there's some good animations on uh, Twitter, and I'm sure on other social media we can find this, uh, it turns out that Hezbollah has been hiding not just the weapons themselves, but the launches, the weapons and the launches, inside people's homes. Uh, they basically went uh, uh, with this kind of deal to many of the civilians in, um, in South Lebanon. They said, look, these are mainly Shiites, but, but I think others as well. Look, we'll build you a new house. New house, everything. We'll, we'll spend the money. We'll build you a new, nice, big house. And you have to dedicate a, you know, a portion of it to put in a you know, ballistic missile <laughs> that we can launch at any time from your home. You know, we'll take it out of the garage launch it, and sneak it back into the garage, right? And then load it up again. And a lot of people, a lot of people, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, took them up on this. And there were massive uh, storage of missiles and launches and uh, drones, uh, weaponized drones, in people's homes in South Lebanon. So what Israel did today is they basically uh, took over the cell phone network in, uh, in Lebanon, and they uh, sent a recorded message to the cell phones of thousands of Lebanese, uh, uh, basically telling them, if in your home there happens to be weapons of Hezbollah, or if your neighbor might be storing some weapons of Hezbollah, 
Um, you should probably get out of town. You should probably get away because we're going to blow them all up. They didn't say that, but that was implied. Uh, and, uh, you know, these things, when they blow up, this is a big explosion. Because not only is the missile blowing up, but then the missile that it's hitting is blowing up. And if you've seen the pictures on, on Twitter, these are fireworks. I mean, so uh, at some point they recommended that people leave to a distance of at least one kilometer. Well, the Lebanese got the message. And today what you saw is convoys of cars, massive traffic jams, leaving South Lebanon, going north of Lidlitani River. And that was in the morning. And Israel started bombing individual homes which had these weapon system, these weapons in them. And you can see secondary explosions and third explosions and all of, all of this was going on. Um, you also saw a significant, uh, significant number of casualties, many, many more casualties uh, today in Lebanon uh, than we've seen uh, certainly in the Northern Front uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, as much as some of the, maybe even more than I I any, any day in Gaza. So we're talking about hundreds of people dying today uh, in South Lebanon uh, because they didn't uh, leave their home or because they're Hezbollah fighters and, uh, and uh, they were engaged in activities uh, related to trying to bomb Israel. Um, let's see. So, so uh, that happened in the morning. Hundreds of targets were, you know, yesterday, everybody's impressed by the fact that 150, 200 targets were hit. Today, overall, in the entire day, the last number I saw was that Israel hit 1,100 different targets. 1,100 targets were hit uh, during the day today. Uh, but in the afternoon, uh, uh, the Israeli military basically expanded the attack to the Baka Valley. Now, the Baka Valley is further north and further east of what's typically called South Lebanon, uh, which is the area beneath this river called the Litani. The area between the Litani and the Israeli border is, called, is typically referred to as Southern Lebanon. The Baka Valley, if you think, is northeast of that. Uh, and it's a large valley. It's a valley in which, in 1982, last time Israel went into Lebanon in a big way, there were major battles there. The Syrians have occupied the, the Baka Valley. There were, there were battles there with the Syrians. Uh, anyway, uh, today uh, this was expanded. These now, the Baka Valley is further away from Israel. The missiles being stored in people's homes are more likely to be cruise missiles or ballistic missiles. These are missiles that can go a, a, a far longer range than the missiles that are typically held in, in, in the south of Lebanon. Um, and uh, Israel went after those. Uh, so uh, all afternoon and early evening, they were bombing, um, they were bombing these uh, locations. Um, and uh, again, the number of casualties on the Lebanese sides is in the hundreds. And uh, the number of missiles destroyed, I don't know, probably in the thousands. Uh, the number of launches uh, are probably in the hundreds. Uh, this is a major operation. I mean, basically, it was wave after wave after wave of F-16s and F-15s, I think primarily. I'm sure the F-35s were there as well. Waves after waves of Israeli bombing, uh, very accurate bombing, uh, targeted at Hezbollah infrastructure, targeted at Hezbollah weapon systems. And, and just total destruction, total devastation of them. Now, at the same time, uh, uh, early on, Hezbollah, you could tell, was in some way caught off guard, and, and they, they tried to retaliate, but their missiles went away and, and unfocused, and they went very far. They were primarily, again, the usual tit-for-tat type missiles that hit the Northern Galilee and the Golan Heights. Uh, then towards evening, they got organized. It, it appears they got organized. And... Um, I know that air raid shelters, uh, air raid sirens uh, sounded at my parents' place uh, just outside of Haifa or on kind of the northern slopes of Haifa, so really facing Lebanon, straight facing Lebanon, um, earlier this evening. Uh, you can find uh, right now online, you can find pictures of uh, the Iron Dome working above Haifa, where I was the day before yesterday and where my parents live. And uh, so uh, I don't think there were any impact. Nothing hit the ground. Uh, but it must be scary for the citizens in Haifa to see these, uh, these bombs. They're experiencing now what southern Israel has experienced for many, 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 many years, sadly. That is uh, missiles heading towards them and, and, and watching the Iron Dome take them out for the most part. 
so it seems like Hezbollah got their act a little together. They, they still have some missiles and some accuracy. Uh, they also launched the missiles in the direction of Tel Aviv. That is the distance they got right, but they, they missed to the east. Uh, and and they, as I said, they hit uh, some targets in the, uh, in the West Bank rather than, um, rather than uh, in, um, in Israel proper. Again, most of those... Now, what's interesting, I read... I, I think this is true. I, I read this in, uh, in one of the reports. Israel does not have an Iron Dome uh, to protect the West Bank. The idea is Hezbollah and Hamas don't want to kill West Bank Arabs. These are Palestinians that are supposed to be their people. They're supposed to be all one... So uh, the Iron Dome was not, did not protect. The, so there was actually a lot of uh, hits uh, in the West Bank. They just didn't hit anything, uh, any humans. They, they hit uh, open ground. Um, but anything that approached Tel Aviv, any approached a little bit further west, were knocked out of the sky. Again, as far as I know, uh, I haven't seen any evidence that any of the missiles targeting Haifa, Haifa uh, hit any buildings. I will say that the missiles targeting Haifa were clearly targeting uh, civilians. This was not targeting the massive industrial infrastructure that Israel has in, uh, in the Bay of Haifa. Uh, this was targeting the Carmel. This was targeting the area uh, of um, where people live. Um, just to give you a sense of what life is like, right? And it is interesting to be in Israel right now. Am I, did I freeze? Oh, you're playing around with it. Okay, I, you scared me there because I'm, you know, I'm now traumatized by freezing. Um, yesterday, uh, the biggest hospital in the north of Israel, it's called Rambam. It's a hospital my father worked in for decades, for many, many years. He was a, uh, a vice dean in the, bus in the uh, medical school and, and uh, was the um, uh, head of a, a department there. Uh, last night, Haifa, uh, uh, this morning, they released 200 patients uh, who could be released home. And then they took all the patients in the hospital and they took them underground. So the hospital in Haifa is basically has a twin, a smaller twin. So they built layers of the hospital under the ground uh, in, in basically a protective shelter. And today they moved all those patients underground, the doctors and the nurses are all working underground taking care of those patients. Because it's a smaller facility, they released 200. But also, they, they, uh, during the day, they've been transporting people from other hospitals in northern Israel to this facility that's underground in Rambam. So imagine hospitals in Israel have to think about what happens when we get bombarded. Right? And this is a day-to-day a -day activity. And the reason for that is, is because, again, the country is tiny. I, I don't think Many people have a, a concept of how small this country really is. Uh, so uh, Rambam has underground hospital. Hooray for them. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that they have that ability. Uh, and, the, and the patients are going to be safe because they're going to be underground. Uh, you know, the, so, uh, you know, today was very tense in Haifa. There was this real sense that Hezbollah will attack Haifa. Um, and then you, you drive down to Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv is a little further, still within missile range of Hezbollah. But if you drive around Tel Aviv, people are sitting in restaurants, coffee shops, and they're living their lives. And life goes on. I, I'm sure there'll be nightclubs tonight, and bars open tonight, and people will continue uh, living. And there is this real sense that it, even though Israel is tiny, um, living in the south of Israel is very different during, you know, <laughs> October 7th, for example, um, living in the south of Israel is very different around Gaza than living in the north of Israel. It's very different than living in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. The dynamics are so different, and they all have different characters, but the, the dynamics during warfare are incredibly different. So uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting country. I encourage everybody to visit. It's, it's definitely worth visiting. Not now, you know, when things calm down, uh, but you should come. Anyway, um, so when Israel bombed the Baka Valley, it also did the same thing. It told people to leave. It told people that if they have weapons in their house, or if their neighbors have weapons, or if anybody in the neighborhood has weapons, they should leave. And they have been convoys out of the Baka Valley. Indeed, um, uh, Lebanese uh, Department of Education has announced no school uh, in the next few days, and they are turning the schools into shelters for all the uh, refugees, if you will, 
from uh, South Lebanon and from the Baca Valley who are escaping the bombardment of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Lebanon. So this is stage three. And my expectation is that this stage might continue another day or two. That is, I would expect another round of massive uh, dramatic bombings um, uh, tomorrow. And then, and, and this is the big question, right? Uh, and then at some point, whether this is sometime tomorrow, whether this is Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, I expect troops to start entering Lebanon and Israel to occupy uh, a segment of Lebanon up until to the Litani River um, in, in the very north, in the northeast, maybe a piece of the Baka Valley there. Where Litani River goes east-west and then goes straight north, right? It goes straight up. Uh, they will, I, I don't know exactly what the borders are, but Israel is very familiar with this terrain. It occupied this terrain in the 90s. Um, it, 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 left, it left southern Lebanon in 2000. Uh, so it's very familiar with that terrain. And then there'll be a big question, what happens then, right? Once it occupies southern Lebanon, what happens then? Um, my guess is that the Biden administration is already jumping up and down and uh, frantic and crazy. Escalation, escalation. It's the new word that I've learned to hate. Um, and, uh, and they're trying to cut deals in the background. I don't think it's anybody to deal with. Oh, one thing I missed about today. One thing they did uh, later th this afternoon or early evening is there was one last commander in the Hezbollah commander stru command structure, the head, the head of the southern district of Hezbollah that is responsible for all of southern Lebanon. Israel assassinated him uh, tonight. Uh, they assassinated him in Beirut. So they bombed another building in Beirut and got him. Uh, so basically, Israel knows where they are. They know, they have, in their intelligence is so good right now that they know where everybody within the Hezbollah hierarchy is. My guess is they know where Nasrallah is. Uh, but I think Nasrallah's a coward. Uh, he hasn't appeared live in an event in many years because he's afraid. And my guess is Nasrallah is deep in a tunnel, in a bunker somewhere that Israel probably can't get to. Um, but we'll see. You never know, right? Uh, who knows? He might have, uh, might, maybe he's turned off all the electronics and turned off the lights because um, who knows? Maybe the bulb will blow up in his face. Uh, so, uh, but they know where these people are. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, I, I wish the intelligence was this good about Gaza. If it was, then they would know where all the hostages are and they would, they would have launched military operations to save them. There is one other, I, I, since I mentioned Gaza, I'll go to Gaza for a minute and then come back to this. There is a rumor out there, or, the, or the, the Israeli military intelligence right now is investigating, together with the Shabak and the Mossad, they're investigating the possibility that Sinwar, the head of uh, Hamas, was killed in one of the bombings uh, over the last few days, or the last few weeks. Uh, Sinwar has gone silent, uh, nobody has heard from him, not even within Hamas hierarchy. The Qataris, the Egyptians, the Egyptian intelligence, the, the Americans, uh, nobody's heard from him. And one possibility is that he was killed. You know, we'll see. Uh, we, can all be, we can all hope that he has died, uh, hopefully very, very slowly. But uh, there the certainly is no certainty, and Israel's not ready to announce they killed him. They're going to wait to uh, accumulate intelligence. I think within the intelligence community, there's disagreement about whether this is true or, or not. So again, uh, we will see. Uh, what else do I want to tell you about uh, Lebanon? So then the question becomes, as I said, what will happen? The Biden administration is going to put a huge amount of pressure on Israel once it takes, well, already is putting pressure. It might put a lot of pressure on it not to actually put boots on the ground in Lebanon. But it might have accepted that as a fact. So I did see a story just before we started the show that the Americans have requested that Israel uh, give it space to put troops on the ground in Lebanon to evacuate American citizens. So uh, the U.S. is evacuating Americans from Lebanon, which I think means that they realize that this is real, that this is a war that Israel is actually going to enter into Lebanon. Now, whether that means that the Israelis will go to Beirut, like I would suggest, uh, and maybe maybe uh, get a bulldozer and find... And find uh, uh, Nasrallah in, uh, in, uh, in the deep well that he is hiding in and drag him out and, uh, and maybe hang him from a tall tree. Um, no, they won't do that. But, um, but yeah, go to Beirut and finish the job. 
Uh, I doubt that they'll do that, but that is, is, a, is a possibility. I, I don't know what, uh, what the planners have, but certainly I think at this point they will go into southern Lebanon. And then I think the pressure will start from the French and from the Americans, uh, primarily from the Americans, to negotiate, uh, to negotiate a deal. There is a uh, UN Resolution 1701, I think it's called, uh, that basically states that Hezbollah must stay north of Libitani and that the UN would occupy southern Lebanon. Um, you know how well that worked. The UN, by the way, is still in southern Lebanon. They're still pretending to be peacekeepers. That has worked really well for them. Israel, by the way, told them to evacuate today. They didn't want to kill any UN personnel uh, by accident. Um, these are not quite the same UN personnel as UNRWA, which are terrorists themselves uh, and, and facilitators of terrorism. These are, prob these are just weak, pathetic, impotent UN uh, uh, soldiers. Uh, I, I remember years ago driving along the road uh, on the northern border. There's a road where you can actually, you know, you could throw a rock into Lebanon. Uh, you can see Lebanon right there. And you would see the UN soldiers hanging out uh, in their little thing. And they would have the UN flag. And right next to them, somebody would have a, a, a Hezbollah flag hanging, even though there weren't supposed to be any Hezbollah there. Um, and uh, I mean, that showed just right, right in that image, the weakness of the UN. Um, so I, I think there'll be a lot of pressure. I, I, I don't know what kind of deal Israel could accept. Uh, obviously, Hezbollah uh, did not fulfill 1701. Obviously, the UN didn't live up to its commitments vis-a-vis -vis 1701. Uh, as you know, uh, I, I would argue that, the United, that Israel and the United States and pretty much every other Western country should leave the UN and uh, should tell the UN to go take a hike, uh, maybe uh, move it to Caracas in Venezuela. I think that would be appropriate housing for the UN. Uh, that's really beautiful real estate on, uh, in Manhattan that should be taken over by some commercial enterprise, uh, maybe a bank, something like that. That would be appropriate. But uh, so then they'll start negotiating. I, and what kind of deal they can cut, I don't know. Uh, but I think, I think what Israel should do, uh, at a minimum, they, they won't do the maximum, but a minimum, uh, they have to, they have to uh, preserve uh, west, uh, southern Lebanon as, in a sense, a demilitarized zone. Uh, the only way they can do that, the only way that that can be enforced is that Israel enforces it. They have to be, uh, they have to, uh, be willing to, and, uh, and the world just has to accept that they're going to enforce that demilitarization. That could be with literally troops on the ground. It could be with drones. It could be with all kinds of technology. Uh, but they're going to have to find a way to, um, to stay in southern Lebanon, or in other words, to keep Hezbollah out. Now, there is a kind of a very optimistic scenario, which is possible here. Unlikely. Very unlikely, but possible. And that is that Israel weakens Hezbollah so much, and it hasn't done it yet. There's still a lot more work that it needs to do in order to achieve this. But Israel weakens Hezbollah so much that the Lebanese, who are not Hezbollah, now remember, Hezbollah is part of Lebanese society. It's part of Lebanon. But it's not all of Lebanon. It doesn't represent all of Lebanon. Lebanon is a very tribal society. Hezbollah represents most Shiites in Lebanon, but really not all Shiites in Lebanon. There's another political party that represents other Shiites in Lebanon who are not supporters of Hezbollah necessarily. And then the Sunnis, who, uh, the Muslim Sunnis, who don't usually get along with Shiites, don't necessarily support Hezbollah. The Christians don't support Hezbollah, although some Christians have allied with Hezbollah because it's been in their kind of political interests, so-called, for a while to ally with them. And then the, the Druze, who've always had a pretty strong military force, who historically didn't align with Hezbollah, but again, Hezbollah has dominated uh, Lebanese politics for 30 years now. So everybody's been an affiliate of Hezbollah at some point, but none of them like Hezbollah. I, I, I bet you the Druze and the Christians and the Sunnis all hate Hezbollah's guts. I mean, imagine if the Lebanese army, which is really based on primarily Christian foundation, with Christians there, but if they got the Jews and they got the Sunnis on board with them, imagine if they took on the, ca the task of uh, taking the advantage of Hezbollah being weakened by Israel, of basically dismantling Hezbollah from within. And that is what should happen. That would be the ideal scenario. That would be uh, an ideal for Israel. 
And then any deal that would happen would happen between Israel and Lebanon and the Lebanese army and the Lebanese government with a guarantee that Hezbollah is no longer a military force within Lebanon. Again, unlikely scenario, but, you know, if, it's the most optimistic outcome I can think of. Uh, the most, you know, the most realistic outcome is there's no deal. Uh, Nasrallah stays obstinate. He's willing to have his people killed. Uh, uh, he doesn't care about their lives as many as necessary. And Israel literally has to go to Beirut and, 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 and find him and kill him and destroy the organization from within. And then maybe the Lebanese can take over. Again, Israel has not a very good experience with that from the 1980s. Uh, but this time, hopefully, Israel retreats out of Lebanon fairly quickly, at least out of northern Lebanon, and only keeps southern Lebanon. It, it basically dismantles all the weapon systems. Now, um, having said all that, the reality is that no long-term solution can actually happen. No long-term solution can actually happen uh, in the Middle East, more broadly, in Israel's wars, uh, in Israel's conflict with the Palestinians, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, other Arab countries, and with Hezbollah and Hamas and everybody else. No possible solution can be achieved as long as the Iranian mullahs are in power as long as the barbarian regime, barbaric regime of uh, Iran uh, continues to rule Iran and continues to be as well-funded as they are. Uh, it has to be high on the priority list for Israel. I mean, it certainly should be high on the priority list for the United States, but I don't think the United States has the balls, the courage, the strategic thinking, the whatever. It has the military power to do it, but it doesn't have the foresight, the foresight and the principles to actually uh, take out the Iranian regime, but somebody has to take them out. Um, I was saying earlier today to somebody, you know, somebody needs to get to Khamenei's Bipa. And it's not just Khamenei, it would have to be Khamenei and his son, who might be Khamenei too, and uh, the president and the council of elders, whatever they call them, the council of, uh, uh, you know, Islamist judges, and you know, taking out the school in Homs. And, I mean, it would have to be a systematic annihilation of radical Islamists in Iran. We're talking about, you know, several thousand people have to, having to be destroyed. It's not a huge project. The other option is, this one would even be easier, this one's super simple, is destroy the Iranian economy. You could destroy the Iranian economy in, a, in less than a week, probably in a day. Um, the Iranian economy, I've said this before on a show, I think they have one basic, one terminal out of which all the oil exports, exports happen. You take out that terminal, that's it. They have no revenue. You also should take out their nuclear power plant, uh, the nuclear program, the nuclear power plant they're building. You take out, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of the uh, uh, Islamic Republican uh, or Revolutionary Guard. But it, this is not hard. Uh, it's harder for Israel because Israel's just, it's far away. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's just Israel's busy right now. But it's easy for the United States who has aircraft carriers right there who could take them out and, and finish. But you could destroy, you could destroy the oil fields, you could bomb the oil fields, create fires. The environmentalists would love you for doing that. I mean, then you'd really see Greta be angry. Right now she's just angry, but she would really get super angry if you actually blew up the oil fields and caused fires and CO2 emissions and all of that. But she wants to stop oil. But she wants to stop oil. So maybe that anger would, you know, may, maybe they could, maybe it could be an alliance between Israel and Greta um, to, stop, uh, to stop oil from Iran. Um, anyway, you know, the Iranians have to be taken out. Otherwise, this doesn't end. Uh, at least uh, you might get some peace for the, in the short run, but you're not going to get anything long run with, as long as Iran is ruled by who Iran is ruled by. Um, uh, all right, let's see. What else, uh, what else do we want to talk about the Middle East? Anything else that I haven't covered? Um, you know, the, 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 the search for the hostages and for Hamas leadership continues, as I said, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, Israel's still bombing there. Uh, I think it used helicopters today in the Gaza Strip. The airplanes were all busy in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, but Israel, I mean, this is the thing. Um, you know... I, I mean, Israel, and, and I think some of the objectivists in Israel and non-objectivists in Israel are concerned about Israel's viability. Is, is this country, can it survive? 
it's surrounded by enemies, by hundreds of millions of enemies. I mean, Egypt, just Egypt is like, what, 80 million or 100 million or, or something like that? I mean, it's a massive country. Um, the militaries of many of these Arab countries are not better. Uh, Egypt has American weapons, Saudi Arabia has American weapons, uh, uh, and many of the other, uh, so, and then uh, there's Iraq, and there's Iran, and there's Syria, and there's Lebanon, and, and it just seems overwhelming, and all out Middle East war, and you've got generals on TV saying, we would lose such a war, and we don't have enough troops, and we, uh, you know, the IDF is not good enough, they're not competent enough, and all of that in many respects is true. It's a small army, and the many, many weaknesses that the I IDF has, uh, it's, 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 um, you know, it's like churches, Churchill State is something like, similar to Churchill's. It's, it's not a perfect army, but it's by far the best. <laughs> so um, uh, all the problems that uh, IDF has, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranians have tenfold the number of problems. Uh, but uh, people are existentially worried, can the country survive? Will it survive? And, you know, I am optimistic, if you can call it optimism. It's, it's, my view is, and this is true of the West generally, right? This is true of the West, is we're going to survive. We're going to survive less optimally than we could. More people are going to die than should. We're going to be poorer than we should be. But we're not going to just collapse. And we're not going to lose. And it's not, it's partially because of our virtue. And what are those virtues? We're somewhat rational. We're somewhat free. And that's enough. Uh, and we're more than somewhat. We're pretty free and pretty rational. I mean, just look at the tech. Look at the beeper operation. Wow. The long-term rational thinking that went into putting that together. The planning, the contingencies, the red teaming, the... Just the strategy, the strategic thinking. I mean, they're rational people here. So we have rationality and freedom on our side. Even, not, even if it's not perfectly implemented, even if we don't have a full moral backbone, even if we don't understand everything in terms of what's at stake, we have enough in Israel and in the West to where we shouldn't be worried about the, the Islamists. Um, we shouldn't be worried about the Russians, the Chinese, eh, maybe a little bit, but really, no. Uh, the West is so much more powerful and will continue to be as long as it stays somewhat rational and basically free. And, uh, and again, this relates to, to generally the West. Is the West in decline? Yes, but the Western decline means that it's basically um, growing economically slower, that it's not having as much of a positive impact on the world out there, and that it's creating circumstances within the West that could lead to its demise, but are not yet leading to its demise, because we have enough freedom and enough rationality to keep going. And there's one other thing, we're rich. And to dissipate all of our wealth would require just such economic catastrophes that I just don't see them anytime soon on the horizon. I mean, bad things are going to happen, but not at the level of wiping out the wealth that's been accumulating at the West. And, you know, so when people say, oh, I gave this example earlier today. When people say, oh, the Muslims are going to take over Europe. Uh, you know, Islamism is going to take over Europe. Look what's happening in Germany. Look what's happening in all these places in France. And my response to that is, no. I mean, Islamism is, Islamism is too weak. They're too pathetic. They're too irrational. They're too authoritarian. They're too weak. I mean, they, don't, they can't even build the explosives to, that they wear on their vest when they blow themselves up. They have to import it. They, they, they don't know the science behind the, the, explosions, the explosives going, going off. They don't. Right? And, you know, the... And, and there was suicidal religion, right? They, they, there's a certain element that, 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 that the Islamists, they, 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 they want to die. Those civilizations can't survive. It's not a civilization. Those cultures cannot thrive. They cannot win. They cannot establish an empire. The Arab empire, when it was an empire, did not have that mentality. It was not an empire of suicide. 
It was an empire, if anything, of Aristotle. It was the empire of learning, of philosophy. And when it lost the learning of philosophy, it reverted to barbarism and poverty and decadence and nothingness. So, uh, you know, you, you, barbarism is not a winning strategy. It's a losing strategy. So Islam will never take over Europe, but what it could make Europe become is a place we wouldn't want to live in, a place of, you know, uh, uh, racism, of authoritarianism, of fascism, of maybe even concentration camps, just this time with Muslims inside of it. And that's not a good thing. It's not a Europe you want to live in, but that could be the outcome, could be the consequence of what's happening. The one outcome that I think is basically impossible is Islam taking over Europe. It's the same... I mean, in some level, my attitude towards um, my, my, uh, my chat is not the same as the my behind or is that chat behind? I think it might be this one. This one is frozen. Oh, oh that one's frozen. Okay, frozen again. That word. Ah. Um, it's same with my attitude about. So you can't do anything about it? Right. Okay. So it's the same as my attitude towards the left, to some extent. I don't think the woke, crazy left can win. I just don't think enough people will ever support their wacky ideas. I don't think enough people in the world are egalitarians. People just won't do it. The problem, I think, is the backlash against that. And the backlash against that will be a kind of fascism, a kind of classism a kind of anti-egalitarianism, but not in the positive sense, of, uh, based on ability. And, 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 uh, but what? The picture's not frozen. What oh, this oh, no, you said frozen and they got... Uh, you freaked out. out. I'm freaked out as well about frozen. The word is, is very upsetting to me. Um, why did it turn brown? What turned brown? Now, I'm, now I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm, uh, Enric says I'm good. Whew. Thank you, Enric. Oh, by the way... It, 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 can somebody make it colder in here? It's super hot. It's super hot. Um, so anyway, I, it's for the same reason I don't think they're wacky. The, the, the left is so wacky that they can't. The right, the fascists, and this is what I think what Germany did, is they leverage off of capitalism. They leave enough kind of economic freedom a little bit here and there to be able to still suck out the wealth, and they have a runway. Whereas the communists come and they nationalize everything and everything collapses. You see that in Venezuela right now. Uh, so I think the fascists in America are the ones who are likely to win, not the, uh, not the egalitarian left. And the egalitarian left is not even communist. It's woke and uh, nihilistic and egalitarian. 